fraud and abuse. So, I think we all know what fraud is, hopefully. Hopefully we know what it is, but we haven't committed it, right? Well, no, I'm just... <laughs> Gotta watch you. <laughs> um, so fraud is an intentional act of deception, which means that we have purposely tried to trick someone, right? Mm -hmm. We all have tried to trick someone. We have fraud. We all did. <laughs> so then maybe you, maybe she has. <laughs> abuse deals more with improper acts, right? So we know the difference between fraud and abuse, right? So common forms are false claims, duplicate billing, upcoding, and kickbacks for referrals. You guys know what these are? Mm -hmm. or should I go through them? What's the kickbacks for referrals? I'm glad you asked. We're gonna get to it a little bit later. We're gonna talk a lot about kickbacks. So I'll quickly go through the history. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. But as you can see, there have been several laws and acts over the years that have been related to fraud and abuse. Um, starting from the False Claims Act, going through to MTALA, antitrust laws, Start one and two, which kind of deal with kickbacks, and again, we'll talk about that later, and anti-kickback laws. We'll talk a little bit about the False Claims Act, because this is one of the first ones. It was enacted in 1863, so that was a long time ago, right? But it dealt with the government trying to fix the issue of fraudulent or improper healthcare claims. Everybody knows what a claim is. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that the claims issue has been going on for a while. And in the 80s, they made some amendments to the False Claims Act, um, one of them specifically being that they removed the requirement that there be specific intent to defraud the federal government. Does anybody, can anybody give me a reason why you think that might be important to make that change? Because you might not actually have a... How hard do you think this would be to prove? Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of cases might have gotten off because they weren't able to prove that it was intent to defraud the federal we government? We accidentally did it. We, we missed that. Oh, right. right, exactly. Um, you're right. Qui Tam, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, but basically it means a whistleblower. Everybody know what a whistleblower is, right? It's someone who knows about something and you might consider them to be like right. a snitch <laughs> or a tattletale or whatever, however you say it. But that's basically what a whistleblower is. Um, in some instances, whistleblowers are rewarded money if they come forth and basically tell if they know of something that's being fraudulent or abuse. <clears throat> So in the 90s, we had this thing called Operation Restore Trust. And basically, what this did was it gave authority for people to do further investigation on healthcare fraud and abuse. So basically what this means is, by the time the 90s came around, people really started to see how big of an issue it is. And if you look over the years, you, and there was just a recent story, I think last month, where they found someone in New York, or New Jersey, somewhere up there, that had done like $2 million worth of fraudulent mm -hmm. billing and stuff like that. So it's, this is, we're talking a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about hundreds of dollars. We're talking about millions of dollars um, that can happen as a result of fraudulent and abuse. And as I just said, so this Operation Restore Trust Program has been proven to be successful. Billions, not millions, not thousands, billions of dollars have been restored to the program as a result of settlements, fines, judgments, what have you. Because once these people or organizations are found to be guilty, they either um, have to pay it back, they're fined, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, more recently, the trust has had some things added to it, with one being RACs, recovery audit contractors, and HEAP, Healthcare Fraud Prevention and Enforcement Action Team. And these, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and, and the healthcare form. These things have been as a supplement to the original trust, all created to also try to recover lost dollars that, that have resulted as, um, you know, due to fraudulence and abuse. So the government has finally realized how important it is to try to investigate further these things so that we can recollect that money. And I want to mention that also when organizations are found to be guilty of this, in most cases they are punished not only by being fined, but they no longer receive um, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. So we have Social Security Act and the criminal disclosure provision. This basically, the provision makes it a felony, we all know what a felony mm -hmm. is, makes it a felony for a healthcare provider or beneficiary to possess knowledge of the occurrence or of any event happening. So what that means is if you're a nurse and your doctor is um, upcoding mm -hmm. and you know about it and it's proven that you knew about it, mm -hmm. you're going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. Everybody understand that? So they're working together. Because he can get paid in that. Well, Doctor that's how it happens happen sometimes. But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. But they may still have knowledge. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. they're not getting a cut at all, but they knew that it was happening. The, the point is that if they knew, they should have said something. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so they're serious about this. It's felony. Um, and may include prison time, mm. right? This is serious. The government is no longer playing around. What if the patient understood the vulnerability? Um, that's a good question. Like we get statements, so I'm just kind of curious. Myself. You mean, wh what if the patient knows that it's wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if the patient, I mean, of course the patient can report it, interest. but I don't know if they would receive any payment. Oh yeah, like no, but I just mean in general if you report it. Would, would anything happen to the patient or? Yeah, I mean, what would be the repercussion? Well, I think the, the key is that they're trying to get people to report. The, the thing that they don't want to see is that people are just sitting around knowing this and they're not saying anything until they get caught. That's when you're going to get punished. Um, if they're able to prove that you knew about this all along and you never said anything, you never reported it, until we caught you, then there's an issue because had you reported it, you know, last year, we could have saved money or whatever. But I've never heard, I mean, I'm sure it may happen from time to time, but I've never heard of. Well, I see it on mine. Uh, I, I, we have track here, and, you know, they go by numbers. And my doctor double coat, I mean, I think it's double coding. I see a one and a three, and they paid him for both, but really we only did one, you know, where we only did three. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I don't know, because I'm not a coder or a dealer, but right. I, when I look at it, I'm kind of like, well, why did he charge for both? We don't pay for it, so it doesn't affect me in a sense, but it affects our... Well, there's some business. ways that physicians have figured out how they can... Code it both ways? Yeah, and it could be one of those. Uh, um, I've just sure. been paying more attention because I don't go on post prescriptions, so we have yeah. to pay huge deductibles now. So now you're So more I attention. wanted to keep all of our statements, right. you know, so I look at them when they come in now. It's possible. Um, I'm not much of a coder either, so it would probably mm -hmm. require, I mean, if, if a patient were to present that, obviously they would be looking into it further to see mm -hmm. um, if it's valid or not. Uh, antitrust. There's a few different acts that deal with antitrust. The main ones are, are the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. The Sherman Act deals with pro prohibiting conspiracies or agreements that restrain trade. The Clayton Act, and you'll probably hear about these in other classes, basically prohibits mergers and acquisitions. This one may be a little bit more important to us as managers because as we see um, more hospitals are merging together or being bought out or acquired. Um, and basically, the Clayton Act says that 
hospitals or organizations can't merge if it's going to substantially lessen competition. Basically, they don't want a, a monopoly to be created. It's basically what the Clayton Act says. So this is important because it has actually prevented some hospitals from merging because it would have been in violation of the Clayton Act. Um, you'll see this as being more of an issue probably in a smaller area where there's not that much competition to start with. Um, but both very important um, acts under antitrust. Do they have a power company? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, start one and start two deal with physician self-referral laws. In the past, I've, I've worked on uh, consulting capacity where we did a lot with making sure that organizations were in compliance with start laws. So this is something that at one point I was working in every day. Basically, the law says that the physicians can't refer patients to other physicians or other organizations which they have a financial interest in. What that means is if I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I have my own office, but I also have my own outpatient surgery center, I cannot um, refer my patients to that outpatient. that outpatient surgery center. What I can do, and what most organizations are doing or should be doing at this point, is when they're um, doing referrals, is what I can do is I can provide you with a list that includes my center on there, but I can't say you go to XYZ um, center down the street because I have a financial interest there. Um, and so that's what this one says. Um, Stark 1 was created specifically for laboratory services, and Stark 2 is created for other ancillary services, which would include therapy, imaging, surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if a physician finds out after the fact that he's violated the law and he knows that he's received money from Medicare, he's violated the laws and is subject to criminal liability if the error is not disclosed. So again, disclosure is the key. You have to t talk. You have to um, make it known that you're aware of something rather than just sitting on it and not saying anything. Um, so uh, what we would do is we would go into physician offices, hospitals, to look at their contracts to make sure that they were in line with Stark, that they weren't referring patients to just one place um, and you know, at some points we found that some hospitals were in violation of some of these rules and offices, and we would, as consultants, ha again, have to disclose that and let them know that we found something. And isn't that the same thing? I mean, isn't that a lot moving towards a lot of pharmaceutical companies that buying the doctors to prescribe their yeah. prescriptions? Yeah, yeah. Like they're not, they're only allowed to take so much, you know, a lunch or whatever, where yeah, they, they used to do whole right. catering events. Yeah, and and they've changed. They've changed it now. The minimums are a lot lower, but mm -hmm. they used to. Um, they can still cater events, but uh, as long as it, it meets, uh, yeah, it has to be true. like Jason's Deli as mm -hmm. opposed to Luigi's. Mm -hmm. um, so the the dollar amounts are just lower now. But yeah, it's kind of similar. I have a friend that works at Cape Fear, and she said that they like completely cut out all of their incentives from the from the pharmaceutical companies that used to bring them in March. Right. And they, I think they've also cut back on um, samples and stuff as well, how many samples they give. Um, <clears throat> some examples under start include paying a physician for a referral. So if I'm a doctor, and I'm picking on you because you're right here, you're a doctor and I say, here's a $100 bill, send me you know, so and so. So that's not good. <laughs> That's a violation. Hospital offering rental space for a physician below fair market value. Rental space is not cheap, right. especially in a hospital. Um, so sometimes what hospitals will do to try to recruit physicians or, um, or in the past what they have tried to do is, if you come work at our hospital, we'll let you have this rental space. They can't do that, that's a violation. Um, there, does anybody know what fair market value is? Tell me. If your house is worth two hundred thousand dollars, that's going to be the market right. value. That's right. what you have to ask for. It. Right. So in terms of this, if the the going rate for rental space is 
$30 per square foot, you can't offer it to the physician for $5 per, mm -hmm. per square foot because that's not fair market value. Um, and in my past job, we did a lot of fair market value work. We had to go out and assess different things to make sure it was fair market value. And if it was not fair market value, they would have to correct it. And we can talk about that later if you guys want. Um, and a physician who received benefits not given to other doctors or staff. Same kind of thing. Um, we can't give a physician an exorbitant uh, signing bonus if we haven't done it for anybody else. It may be a red flag there. Um, so basically, this just deals with being fair. Being fair in the market price that you um, provide, being fair with the benefits that you're giving, it just wants to create a fair playing field for everybody. <clears throat> now, anti-kickback. I told you we would talk more about kickbacks later. This is another regulation that is um, created to try to prevent conflict of interest um, and patient referrals from having. So basically, this anti-kickback rule was designed to prevent offers and bribes um, of payment for referring Medicare patients. So it's kind of similar to what we already talked about. Basically, you can't um, refer Medicare patients in, in exchange for money. Uh, once you start doing that, then Is you're that only for Medicare patients that they, they can't bribe an insurance or try care? Or? Um, well, this, this law in particular deals specifically with Medicare, but remember the Stark law mm -hmm. is more overarching. Um, and so the two are very closely related. Um, what happened at one point was that a lot of providers were being wrongly accused um, of things that were not necessarily illegal. So as a result, they were, um, created these things called safe harbor pr provisions, which were basically like um, uh, certain limits. So that, and this was developed by um, Center for Medicaid Services um, to make sure that people weren't being wrongly accused. Because it is easy to say that, um, so, well, so-and-so paid me to refer, but how are we gonna um, prove that there was the referral there? or how are we gonna um, prove that a patient had Medicare and Medi Medicare only and not something private. So the safe harbor pr provisions were created to try to make sure that this law was being regulated correctly. So now we know what kickbacks are. Kickback is basically, I give you something, you give me something. You give me patience, I give you money. That doesn't work, that's, involved. that's against the law. So it's bottling against the law within the medical, you know, bottle, what they call bottle, is it bottling or bottle? Like you do something for me, then I do something, it's not as changing money, but services. Yeah, it's just kind of like college. Yeah. Bartering. Uh, bartering, yeah. Oh. Um, Athletes can't take cars from the football team to drive around while they're Well, I'm sure that occurs. Uh-huh. But I'm just saying, is that against the law? I mean, that money has not been as changed, just services. It will probably depend on what type of services it is. Okay. If we're talking some major procedure mm -hmm. that's, that costs a lot of money versus sending somebody in for me to ch check their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, but that's probably a way that people try to slot under the radar because they say, oh, well, no money was exchanged. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean it was legal. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what pharmaceutical companies were doing with physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taking them on extravagant vacations. Right. Um, what was I about to say? The anti-kickback statute um, also imposes criminal liability. So again, these statutes and laws and acts are pretty serious. Uh, to answer your question, uh, payment is any kickback, bribe, or rebate, direct or indirect, overt or covert, in cash or any kind, and any ownership interest or compensation interest in return for referring an individual to a person for, or in return for purchasing, leasing, ordering, arranging for, or recommending the purchase, lease, or order of items or services mm -hmm. reimbursable by the federal health care program. Okay. So, um, 
And these are a lot of laws that go across all businesses. Yeah. Well, these they're were just, I mean, they are specific. Yeah. I mean, they have the same height, right? For Let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, we all know about HIPAA. Um, and the Balanced Budget Act also imposed um, civil penalties of 50000 for each violation of Anti-Kickback Act and damages of up to three times the total amount of um, compensation paid. So again, some of these laws that we've already talked about are related to Anti-Kickback and Stark, um, but it's serious. Because what can happen is, let's say you violate more than one of these laws, then you're talking a lot of jail time, a lot of potentially a lot of fines and payments due back to the government. Um, so as I said, these two are pretty similar, um, but there are some differences uh, with the Anti-Kickback Act. Start one and two describe prohibited conduct explicitly. Unlike the Anti-Kickback Act, Stark 1 and 2 are strict liability statutes that don't require proof of intent. That's important. What that means is, let's go over this again, they do not require proof of intent. So we don't even have to prove that they intentionally did it. Mm -hmm. That's important. If it was um, an accident. All right, and that's something that we used to have to relay to um, organizations all the time. Remember, there, ha there doesn't have to be any proof that you intended to do this, mistake or not. So that's important to know. Um, kind of already talked about Safe Harbor. Um, there's four specific categories that Safe Harbor falls under. We talked a little bit about this already, but surgeon owned. ASC is Ambulatory Surgery Center, so basically an outpatient surgery center. Single specialty, so that would be an orthopedic um, ambulatory surgery center. Multi-specialty, so that would be uh, surgery, maybe ENT, multi-specialties, and hospital physician-owned. And we saw this one come up a lot um, where we would have to verify that there was being no violation because from time to time, hospitals and physicians will go in to, to um, joint and joint ventures together on surgery centers. And so those get kind of tricky where we have to make sure that there's nothing going on in violation. Uh, for the four that we just discussed, there's five things that um, have to be in place. The surgery center has to be certified. The loans from the entity or other investors to physician investors are prohibited. Can't do it. Investment interest must be offered on terms not related to the volume of referrals, meaning the volume of people. All ancillary services must be directly and integrally related to the primary procedures performed at the uh, surgery center. Nothing can be billed separately to Medicare. And the surgery center nor physicians practicing at the surgery center can discriminate against federal health care programs, which means we can't say we don't take any Medicare, basically, in a nutshell. Um, they definitely have to, under the safe harbor laws, they have to, be, have, to have open disclosure. Um, you know, it says one third of each physician investor's medical practice income must be derived from the physician's performance at the surgery center. Um, and this ensures that a physician's investment actually represents an extension of their office. Um, and the main reason for these safe harbor laws is they want to make sure that there's no passive investment going on. Again, they want to make sure that there's no conflict of interest, nobody's funneling money and all of that stuff. Um, so these laws are created to kind of protect um, physicians and hospitals and organizations from basically being shady. Um, keep going. talked a little bit about this already with the stack penalties. I think it's important to note that penalties can be stacked. So if you're in violation of more than one of these, don't think that you're just going to be charged for one. They're going to stack them all on top of each other. So you, you might be saying, all right, you know, we're talking about fraud and abuse. Well, these are organizations you're going to be managing. 
So you gotta make sure that you are very aware of these laws because if you have any um, type of inkling that this is going on, you wanna stop it sooner than later. And a lot of times what I found was that in some organizations, the managers had no clue. And you know, it might have been because they were just too busy with other things that they you know, weren't in the financials that much to know what was going on. So it is difficult because as a manager, you'll have lots of things to juggle and balance, but you want to make sure that you're looking at the billing, even if it's only you going to um, your coders once a month to just check with them to make sure <coughs> things are going okay. Maybe you probably need to schedule um, audits to happen, you know, every quarter with the, with the um, charts to make sure things are being coded correctly. And I, I find that more hospitals are moving to that to do the, um, the audits and um, the quality um, departments are, are starting to take, take over that right now um, to, to do that, those things to make sure that they're in compliance. Because if they find they're not in compliance, we're talking lots of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so corporate compliance programs, most larger organizations, you won't necessarily find this in physician offices unless it's a large practice, but most uh, companies are now creating compliance programs, compliance departments, where they're making sure that their organization is in compliance, not just of these laws, but just laws in general. Um, and within these programs, you should have a corporate compliance plan. So again, as a manager, this is something that you should be aware of. You may not memorize the entire plan, but you should know if your organization has one and what it says and what it means. Um, the more that you can speak to your corporate compliance plan, the easier it'll be to sit down and have a meeting with a doctor that you may think that is in violation of something. If you're able to thoroughly speak to your company's corporate compliance plan, the meeting will go over a lot better than if you just go in a meeting with a doctor and you're telling them that they're doing something wrong, but you can't explain why that's important to the organization and, and how the organization feels about that. Is it part of the manager's job to do like the, um, the binders, the, the continuity binders and things like on certain compliances, or would that be assigned to like a certain department other than the manager? It's gonna probably depend on the size of the organization. Like I said, some um, organizations have a specific compliance department, and if in that case, they would be putting together the compliance plan. If you're in a small office or a small hospital, you'll have more responsibilities. Same thing with quality and yeah, like continuity for all of them. Either there's a binder that tells you all the rules and regulations. Uh, tip the managers were in charge of that, or like typically, each department. Um, what I've seen in large organizations is each department will create their portion and then they all just put it together. So in that case, the quality department would create their portion, the compliance department would create their portion and just combine it. Mm -hmm. But it really just kind of depends on the size. Um, obviously, if you're smaller, you're gonna have more responsibilities. So you may. Um, and being in that field, did you say, was that part of the, the typical office continuity folders that are binders for each? Not all offices, not all offices. But yeah. hospitals. Hospitals. Big organizations. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's eight essential elements of an effective comp compliance program, and these are them. I'm not going to go through them, but basically what this is saying is if you're creating a compliance program, you want to make sure that you have these eight things from, you know, with a written policies and procedures, which you should have anyway, all the way to a fraud and abuse plan that says if we do, um, you know, if we are um, found that we are uh, committed fraud, what's our plan? So you have all these steps. Um, within your plan, you are obviously also going to identify areas of risk. Once you've identified these areas, then you develop a plan for it, and the plan should be passed around to all personnel, so kind of what you're going on. And this is something that um, 
in some organizations I've seen that they will uh, discuss this um, uh, initial training. When someone's hired, they'll go over the co um, compliance plan with them or give them a copy of it. Kind of just depends on the organization. Um, once the plan is enforced and is operational, obviously it's only effective if the managers are relaying this information and being supportive within their own areas. So, you know, a plan is only as good as it being implemented. Sure, you can create this strong compliance plan, but if nobody's abiding by it or communicating it or educating everybody on it, then how good of a plan is it really, right? So to just wrap it up, fraud and abuse is definitely a big deal. Um, like I was saying, I can't remember exactly the state. It was somewhere up north, but just last month, they found a, um, a physician guilty of this. So this is a big deal. And I think that as reimbursements are cut, physicians are going to continue to try to find ways that they can still stay afloat. And so they're gonna be trying to figure out how can I cut corners or how can I build this way to make more money so as they're trying to figure out more ways, the managers have to be um, definitely aware of these laws to make sure that they're not committing any fraud just to try to stay afloat. Um, so some keys to being successful with this is obviously you want to inform your employees. You want to keep everybody in the loop so that everybody's aware of what to look for if something doesn't look right, which is going to include physicians. And this may be difficult because um, sometimes sitting down to meet with physicians, educate physicians, is not always easy. Um, the other key is gonna to be to have a strong compliance program. The hospitals that have strong compliance programs are the ones that typically um, don't stand a chance to lose their funding from the government because they're on top of things, so they know that they're doing everything right. And uh, they're constantly, um, tweaking these laws and creating new ones to try to make sure that this fraud and abuse doesn't get out of control. Because just imagine if, you know, all of these physicians and all these hospitals were upcoding and um, filing false claims. Just imagine what would happen to um, the budgets in the government. So it's pretty important, um, important chapter, important information. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, fraud and abuse, kickback, start. No? Then we are done for today. Thank you. Thank you.